Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 19. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do you say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is the reading of God's word. Welcome to Living Faith Community Church. Uh, my name is Stephen Rowe, the pastor of this church. We've uh, been going through a series on the Sabbath, the last uh, five to six Sundays. For those of you who've been with us for the last five or six weeks, uh, we, the time that we've gone through the series of Sabbath, did you find that to be encouraging? Uh, were you blessed? Were you, did you discover something new or did you enjoy the series of Sabbath? If you enjoy the series of Sabbath, say ho. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're going through a new series, a new series called Discovered Church. And uh, I'm, I'm going to be doing something very different. I've been preaching uh, for about 35 years. And uh, probably this series is the first time I'm showing a uh, very, very practical side of the preaching. That it's not just the text, but it's how the text is related to what we do is specifically as a church. So I'm going through the series of uh, church, but in your small group, in your community group, you're going to be going through this book uh, that we'll show you here, Discover, Rediscover Church, Why the Body of Christ is Essential. Those of you who are part of a community group probably bought the book, and uh, those of you who are eager and anxious probably read it already and studied, and, uh, but uh, you will go through this, and the first chapter is about the church. Why is it important? And what I want to do throughout the series uh, is to give you a theological vision of our church. Uh, I'm going to throw out a big phrase up there, a theological vision. That's my aim, to give you theological vision of this church. What do I mean by that? What, does, what do I mean by theological vision? Theological vision is a ministry map that is based on the theological framework. Uh, what you, what, how you understand the theology and the doctrine of the church to be and how that shapes everything we do at church. So theological vision is that middle space between doctrine and ministry programs, between theological conviction and practical ministries. So that's the middle space. And uh, theolo some theologians call it the middleware. There's the hardware and of what is really the base and there's a software of how it's operated, and there's a middleware. So it's that middle space where it connects your doctrine and the ministry programs. Whenever we decide to do something new, whenever we try to do something unusual, whenever we try to do something that is not, not traditional or conventional, at our session meeting with our bunch of leaders, elected leaders, and with our staff, I always ask this question. This is a question I ask, and you can shoot it up there. 
How do we justify our decision? That's got to be theological vision work. How do we justify our decision? Oh, we want to do something like this at our church. Oh, we want to do this. We want to have this kind of program. We want to have this kind of work. We want to, and I always ask, how do you justify it? If people in the church and outside the church ask, why are you doing what you're doing? We always have to be diligent in asking the question in these three ways. How do you justify this theologically? How do you justify this biblically and historically? What does the church history say about this? What does our understanding of the Bible say about this? And what does the Bible say about this? So it's a theological vision statement. We will not, we will not do anything that we cannot justify theologically, biblically, and historically. It's very lazy for us to say, well, the other church is doing it, and it seems to work. I hate that rationale. I, I just despise it. When people tell me, well, the other church is doing it, so we should adopt this in our church. And I'm like, oh, it gives me chills. And I'm like, why? Because we're a church. We're not a business of making profit. We have to ask theological vision question. What does the Bible say? We have to do our hard work. What does the Bible say about this? What's our theological understanding of this? And how do we justify this through Scripture? Why do we have communion every week? We had to go through this. Why do we have fellowship? Why do we have different ministries in the church? So we will spend the next nine weeks discussing our church ministries built upon theological vision. I'm going to give you the schedule. I've never shown people something like this before. This is the anatomy of our church. This is very intentional. We do this. Like I have, we share Google Doc, and I have sermon title, passage, the date, and the theme of, and I skip the theme of what each sermon will be and who will be the preacher. We have the category. So this is what we're going to be talking about, church vision and core values. Uh, Jesus built his church. Next week will be about global missions. So this is, this is what we're trying to do here. This is how we came about. Let me give you a little context. Uh, every year or every often, we have this thing called ministry fair at our church, ministry fair. And that is to introduce to you all what kind of ministries we have and to really ask you to volunteer to be part of ministry and serve in ministry. The best way to, for you to grow as a Christian is by serving, not just receiving. If you eat without exercising, you will not be healthy. Can, uh, I can give you little tips about how to be health, healthy and about human body and that kind of stuff, you know, but uh, uh, you have to exercise and to grow in a healthy way, you want to serve. So we have ministry fair, and we were discussing this, oh, let's have ministry fair, what can we do? And I said, why don't we do this every Sunday as we introduce different ministries? And then someone else said, hey, what if you preach about it? And I said, Ooh, that's an even better idea. So we're going to give you theological vision. Why do we have these ministries? Theologically, I'm going to give you that. And then after benediction, every Sunday, we'll have somebody from that ministry come up and introduce a ministry. Isn't that great? I've never, 30 years of pastoral ministry, I've never done this before, but I'm trying this. And I think this is going to be really fun. I'm, I'm really excited about this. So that's the schedule for the next nine weeks. So today, uh, we will start the series by giving you the most basic teaching about the church. I want to emphasize this. This is very basic stuff, but, but I think it's, I have to say it, that the church is not a building. You all know this. The church is not a building. 
So when you drive by 162nd Street, when you see this building, I know what you mean, I say this too, but we shouldn't be saying, that's our church. That's our church building. That's not our church, right? So when you, when you, I know what you mean, and I say this all the time, in the morning you try to get ready, and then whoever is the person who prepares early, and whoever is you know, always a late person, you always say, hurry up, we're late for church. Church is not just a Sunday program. So we're making two theological errors every time when we say, that's our church, we're late for church, let's go to church. Now, church is not a building, church is not a program. Now, what is a church? Church is an assembly of God's people. It's a gathering of God's people. So what's a church? You. Not as single individual, but when you are together as a group, like this, we've gathered as a church. And this is a sanctuary. So we come together. It's a community of God's people. That's the church. And I can say a lot of different things and go deep into theological discussion about the church and the nature of the church, but I won't. But I will just give you three things today about the very basic things about the church from Matthew 16, 19 to 39, uh, 9, uh, 16, 13 to 19. The founder of the church, the foundation of the church, and the followers who make up the church. The founder of the church. From this passage, Jesus asked this question, simple question. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? What people said about Jesus was important back then, and it's important now, and it's very relevant now. The disciples responded, you're John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. People have different views about you. That's what the disciples were saying. Some people say you're this, some people you say that, some people you're saying John the Baptist was resurrected, Elijah who came back from life and uh, from death, and they're saying all different things, and, and there's basically confessing that uh, people are confused about Jesus' identity. So Jesus asks a follow-up question. But what do you say that I am? Now let me ask you, you've been with me for many years, disciples, 12 disciples. Now that's what people say, like I'm Elijah, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, and different prophets. But what about you? Who am I to you? Two ways to approach this issue as I was meditating on this text. One way is to address the question directly and talk about the messianic identity of Jesus. One way to interpret this passage is to go into the right, directly into the messianic identity of Jesus and to say, yeah, Jesus, you are God, you are this, because the way Jesus asked his question was, especially in this passage, who do you say that I am? That's the name of Jehovah God. And uh, it's, it's one way of approaching the question say, to say that, yeah, you're the messianic God. And the second way to see the question as a leading question to something else. So he's not really, really, really going after, do you understand me? Do you believe me as a Messiah? But he's asking a leading question for them to think about something else, like the church, what he's about to say about the church. What approach would you take? When you read a text like this in your Bible study, I know those of you who are here on Sunday, on President's Weekend and Long Weekend, you're here and you're serious about the Bible. When you read something like this and you're doing your morning devotion and you're worshiping in your own time, when you read something like this, how would you approach this question and say, is this about messianic identity or is it about church that is about to talk about? Which approach will you take? 
Those of you who think it's A, strictly about messianic identity, B, it's about it's a leading question to talk about the church. A and B. Who, who say, how many of you would say it's approach A? How many of you say approach B? How many of you say approach A and B? <laughs> Good. All three of you, thank you so much for participating. Uh, <laughs> participating in this exercise. I really appreciate you. Thank you. The rest of you, that's okay. I still feel the love. That's, that's fine. Uh, here, I do want to emphasize and, and go through this second approach for this particular study here. After Peter's confessional response, Jesus said something very powerful about his church. Verse 17 and 19. It's a leading question. It is about messianic identity, but there's a second approach, and that's a leading question to talk about something else. Verse 17 to 19, he says, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Christ shows his commitment and confidence in his church. He said, I will build my church. This is where the confessional idea that Christ is the head of the church comes from. A lot of us, English-speaking people, when we, whenever we talk about the church, we say, oh, yeah, the Living Faith Community Church. Oh, yeah, yeah, Stephen Rose Church. This is not Stephen Rose Church. Oh, yeah, the church, who's, whatever. And when we say the pastor. And sometimes... I get this over 35 years of pastoral ministry. People say, uh, you know, uh, this church has, and I'm like, what do you mean when you say this church has this idea, the church has this, the church said this, church didn't do this, church did that? Theologically, it should mean you. But practically, you mean me. Like, I'm the church. Like, I will build this church. Theologically, it should be you, the church, but who's the founder of the church? Christ. We use all these theologically incorrect phrases in English language. The founding past of the church, Stephen Rowe. I hope we don't use that kind of phrase. Jesus is the founder. He said, I will build my church. I'm going to move on because I have a lot of things to say uh, later. Second, the foundation. What's the foundation? Now, I'll tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This phrase has caused endless controversies in the church's history. The big question is the meaning of this rock. You are Peter, Bar-Jonah, Simon Bar-Jonah. Now, after, the confess, after your confession, I'm going to give you a new name. You are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. What is this rock? Does it mean man, Peter? Does it mean confession of Peter? Does it mean the teaching of Jesus, rock? Or is it Jesus himself, the rock Jesus is talking about? And we can talk about, I can, you know, preach series of sermons on this. And people are very passionate about how they exegete this verse. And they disregard other interpretations. And they put other people down and say, this is... The only way, and one of, the, one of the traditions is the Petrine theory that says it's Peter, man. And we follow Peter's tradition. Uh, this is a place where we don't want to be too dogmatic, but we want to be sound. 
First, let me tell you what I don't think it means. Jesus is not saying he will build his church on Peter, the man. Jesus did not say, on you, Peter, I will build my church. Instead, Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. He called him Peter, but on this rock, I will build my church. The rock is not Peter, though Peter means rock in Greek, but the rock solid confession of Peter. It's based on your confession upon your confession. The church is built on the confession of Peter. What is that confession? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the foundation of the church. You are the Christ. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we confess this. That's what makes us the church. We're a confessional church. That means our identity and mission are rooted in the confession that Christ is the head of the church. And we are all the beneficiaries of Christ's lordship. He is committed to us and our healthy growth. And that we are founded on this confession so that we can be, we can ask, we can constantly ask this good theological vision question. We're not just here doing so that we can do this church stuff. This is very important. And that's why Apostle Paul exhorts the elders of the church in Acts 20, 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Do we see that verse here? We're going to see that verse on the stage. Yeah, there you go. On, on the screen, rather. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Why am I so serious about the church? Why, whenever we sing about the church, talk about the church, and think about the church, and I pray about the church, I'm like, oh, this is my life. church which Christ obtained with his own blood. He purchased, paid for this church, you all. This is a precious assembly. That's why this is serious. That's why this is such incredible, incredible community. And I keep this verse close to my heart as a pastor. Pay careful attention to yourself. This is God speaking to me. Stephen Rowe, pay careful attention to yourself. You have to be right and holy, blameless, good before God, humble, and pay careful attention to your flock. Church, precious, which Christ obtained with his own blood. This is what I'm picturing. Jesus, living 30 years, and the whole Passion Week of suffering, and going to the cross, dying on the cross, giving up everything. And someone asks, Jesus, why are you doing this? This is what I'm, listening, what I'm hearing. I'm giving up everything so I can obtain the church with my blood. That's what he's saying. 
That's why I have to love you, treat you with most tender care and care for you. Why? Because you're purchased by the blood of Jesus. And this gathering, this assembly is purchased, obtained by the blood of Jesus. Jesus gave up his life and blood and said, I want the church. That's why church is important. And LOCC is part of Christ's church, and he will build it. And this is a promise, beautiful promise. He will not only build a church, but he will sustain it. Continue to listen to what he says in verse 18. If we can show verse 18, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Gates of hell or Hades are not strong enough to prevail against his church. The church will never die. Church will not be defeated. Church is still the hope of this world. Still. Yes, I've been involved in a lot of ministries where we, in our presbytery, where we had to say, this church we have to close down. But the church of Christ will never die, will never disappear. The church will last forever to serve this world. And Christ has given the church the keys to the kingdom of heaven. This is what Jesus says. Whatever the church binds binds on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever the church loses on earth will be loosed in heaven. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? How do you process this? Jesus says, you are the church. And I'm going to give you the keys to heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you decide and whatever you do here will reflect what will happen in heaven. I'm going to push this idea a little further and say that your status in Christ's church represents your status in heaven. That's what Jesus means. That's how important the church is. The church that Jesus obtained with his blood. I'm going to push further because I'm not getting like, what kind of expression? It's like you're like, Oh, okay. So that I, I always want reaction. I'm going to push further. Uh, and uh, okay, I have to uh, qualify my statement before I say this, so I won't get in trouble. Uh, this is in the context of the sermon. And this is a very general but true statement. But not absolute in every, every situation. Generally speaking. Whew, I'm getting nervous. If you're not part of the church, you're not part of heaven. Oh, I hope I can get some response. I hope you can come back after service and say, what? What do you mean by that? And I'd love to discuss with you. Whatever you decide in church on earth, will be the decision that's reflected in heaven. You bind, it was bound. It will be bound up there. You lose, it will be loose. That's basically what it means. That's why we're so serious about what goes on in the church. That's why we're so serious. Now, 
third, the follower. Followers who make up the church. The founder of LFCC, this is a practical application of what it means. Now I've given you doctrinal teaching. I'm going to give you theological vision of how that connects to whatever we do in ministry, and I'm giving you a middleware now, uh, the middle space. The founder of LCC is no other than Jesus himself. We know that. The foundation of the church is the confession that Christ, Jesus is the Christ and the son of the living God who gave us the keys to steward his church with faithfulness and fruitfulness. So, by God's grace, as representative of Christ's overall universal church, 24 years ago, we have this, started this local church called LFCC. And this is the vision that we started with. The vision of Living Faith Community Church is to saturate New York City with the gospel, to bless, transform the life in the city and the world. Three verbs that I wanted to really, really focus on, even though I, I talked to some of you guys and I talked to Peter Kang and I said, you know, I don't like this word now. I really liked it 24 years ago and I'm not really sure now, but Peter says that's okay, so I'm, I'm, I feel confident now. But the vision of Living Faith Community Church is to saturate. That's one verb. Bless, that's the second verb. The third verb is transform. Transform is the word that I'm like, oh, I'm not sure now because I was more triumphalistic when I was 37. Now at 60, I'm like, oh, do we want to really try? Is this really what we want to do? Or is it, I like the word serve, you know, but, uh, but that's, what, that's what goes on in my mind. On our 10th anniversary, Living Faith Community Church has redefined the vision of the church to include what we call three M components, and we came up with 3M vision. That's our 10th anniversary. 10th anniversary, I stood up on the stage, and our elders and our leaders and staff, we all worked through this, and we worked on this paper for many months, and I shared 3M vision, movement dynamics, missional community, and ministry balance. We don't just get that out of nowhere. We, we have to really think through theologically what does the Bible say? And how do we apply this? And I summarized each M with three subpoints. I have to have three for each. So what does movement dynamic mean? Oneness from shared vision and beliefs. Number two, devotion to God's kingdom over self or tribe. We're not going to be, oh, it's my church, my people, my denomination. We have to be much more kingdom-oriented. If we see other churches thriving, we want to say, yes, that's great. We don't want to say, oh, what, the other church is doing that? We got to do better. They're having, what, three-day conference? Oh, we're going to have five-day conference so we can gather more people. No. Let them, all the churches must thrive. Devotion to God's kingdom over self or tribe. It's not our tribe, our denomination, it's God's kingdom. Third, church planting movement for city renewal. We want to constantly church plant. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. Now, second, missional community. Outward faced, mercy and justice, countercultural community. As we meet in our CGs, community groups, and as we serve as a community, we have uh, LCDC, Community Development Corporation, and, and we want to constantly think about how we can be outward faced. We don't want to be an ingrown church. Have you had ingrown toenail? I heard, I heard can be painful. Thankfully, I don't have, I only have haka nails, but uh, thankfully I don't, but, but I heard it's, it's really, really painful. And church can be ingrown. Just think about us. We've got to be out of your face. Think about community. And I hope we can hopefully people who walk on 162nd Street and around here, we can make it so open that folks will come into our church. Ministry balance. 
And this is how I summarize it. Balance between faith and work. Balance between faith and family. Balance between faith and church and ministries was in all the ministries in our church where we can have balance. That it's not just, oh, my ministry is the most important ministry. No, we don't want to be tribalistic. We want the whole church, we want the whole city to thrive and grow. So that's what we're thinking. That's how we are visioning ourselves in the church. 3M vision. All right? Now, how do we get all this? And I'll close with this, and I'm done. I'm surprised that I'm, I'm, I'm done so soon, so quick. Core values. Twenty-four years ago, when we planted a church, we came up with these seven core values in our church. Number one was gospel-driven. That back in the days, there was a, a book that was very, very popular, uh, and, and it was called Purpose Driven Church. Back in the days, like 25, 30 years ago, Purpose Driven Church. And I said to myself, and I'm like, I appreciate this idea, and this is great. I've gained a lot of insight from this book, but I really don't want to have a purpose driven church. Wow, that's a great idea. I learned a lot. I want to have core value driven church. This is who we are. And I say this in our intro to LFCC seminar, and I share this, and I go, these are our non negotiables. This is what makes us us. Number one, gospel driven. The gospel tells us that our root sin is not just failing to obey God, but relying on our obedience to save us. That we want to be constantly, I want to constantly share this message of the gospel with you. That it's not through our obedience we're favored by God. It's not through our performance, it's not, it's not through our sacrifice that God loves us more. It's because of Christ perfect life and death on our behalf. And we're thrilled to share this good news that you're loved and accepted by God because he loves you. Prayer rooted. We want to continue to grow in our prayer life where we will strive to experience dynamic spiritual renewal. Extraordinary kingdom center prayers and messy prayers prayer cohorts, and different things. Why are we doing this? Because of our core values that's based in the scripture. Third, core value, worldview, and life view. The lordship of Christ is over all the areas of life that prevents us from dividing life into secular versus public. There is no secular versus public. Uh, 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 there is no private or sacred, or, or secular public or private sacred. That's what I meant. There is no worldly and spiritual. It's all. Everything we do is spiritual. So there was one time uh, a, a, a child asked me a simple question. I can't remember the question, but I, I remember his, uh, this child's uh, response after I answered. Asked me a question, and I said, whatever gave response, and this child says, are you sure? And I said, yes. And, and this child said, you can't lie, this is Sunday. And I'm like, this child has incomplete worldview where it's like, it's dichotomous. Then I can infer that I can't lie on Sundays, but I can lie on the other days? Oh, you can't lie because this is church. What you can't do at church, you can't do outside. What you can do here, that everything is under the Lordship of Christ. That we don't separate. Right? So that you don't have to do everything like Christian way. When you make a cake, you don't have to put cross there every time to just make like, ah, oh, I feel good. No, you don't have to do that. You don't have to tie your shoelaces in the shape of cross. You don't have to do that all the time. So it's 
We don't secular, public versus private, sacred. We don't have to divide. Number four, this is what we believe. Ethnically diverse will mirror our geographic, geographic neighborhood. That we're united by the gospel. Not through our ethnic or racial commonalities. City positive. We don't just benefit and take advantage of the city and just enjoy it. But we will bless the city. We will really, really bless the city. City of New York. Community base. That the real change happens when we interact with others. That's when the real change happens. Real transformation happens when we are part of a community where there is accountability and there is commitment and there is vulnerability. That's the meaningful, that's a meaningful community. And last, lastly, church planting minded. That we don't consider church planting to be traumatic, traumatic or unusual. It's not something that we do because we just split in the church. No, we're multiplying the church. So as we think about children's ministry, youth ministry, music ministry, fellowship ministry, missions, and, and then all the other ministries, we want to think about what's going to be our next church plan. And, and if we identify church planner and region, who will join to go? Like last week, we celebrate a Korean congregation being going independent. Ten years ago, we planted King's Cross. And can we have, can we think about this? Not just in the sense of accomplishment of, yeah, this is what we did, but that, that it could be part of our DNA, that this is what we're thinking constantly. This is what we're thinking about. Our commitment to church, that, that our commitment is not just so that we work so hard so that we can become a big church. Our commitment is so that we really enjoy Christ and his presence and the gospel power so we can share this good news to others through church planning, through this gospel renewal and gospel movement. This is an amazing privilege and the responsibility to be the church, to serve the city for the glory of God. Amazing responsibility. Amazing privilege. Incredible privilege to be part of his church where I can say, I belong. I belong. I hope you can all say, we belong here. As Christ promised, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And we continue to be faithful to the Lord and serving and loving our neighbors within the church and outside the church.